Now, what is the serial peripheral interface SPI? The serial peripheral interface SPI is only intended for short distance communications within a single device. A synchronous serial interface such as RS232 UARTS only requires two signals wires to exchange the information. See the video. I will explain here basics of SPI communications and different modes of SPI communications. We use serial communications in electronics embedded systems to transfer data from one electronics device to another. And it is one of the standard and most popular communications protocols. Serial peripherals interface and it is one of the most widely used interface between microcontroller and peripherals such as the sensors ADC, DAC, shift registers and many more. SPI communication is a synchronous type of communications protocol. In synchronous communications protocol, all devices who are communicating with each other have the same clock signal. The reason why we use the SPI communications is because it is very fast which works with high speed up to 8 megabits per second or even more than and supports higher clock frequencies as well if you don't know what synchronous and asynchronous communications protocol is then you can watch a video. I have explained both of them in a very interesting way. The SPI communications is a full duplex communications protocol having a master and slave configurations. Well, what happens with full duplex communications? In this mode, two devices who are talking to each other can transmit and receive data at the same time. So, SPI communications doesn't really on just one data line. When two devices are communicating using SPI protocol, one out of them is master and second is the slave. A master can be connected to multiple slaves and there are four dedicated connections lines which are necessary for SPI communications at the master site, there is the MUSI that is master site. Then comes the MISO that is the mastering slave out clock signals. And finally there is a chip select line. As per the name, MUSI means the master sends data to the slave and slave receives that data on the MISO line and slave sends the data and master receives it. The clock in the communications is very important for synchronizations. Master initiates the clock signals and all slaves received are the same data as per clock signal. And finally comes the chip select line. This select line is dedicated for each slave. If there are three slaves to a master, then master will have to pull out three chip select lines and connect these select lines to each slave one by one. So if you see this is the limitations of SPI communications, the number of GPIOs restrict the maximum number of slaves. This chip selected is an active low signal. Generally, it is pulled high that is at VCC level. If the master and slave are not talking to each other, when a master needs to communicate with a particular slave, it will pull the clock select line to ground, which notifies the particular receivers that the master wants to send the data. SPI is a standard protocol. What does that mean? Well, unlike UART and I2C communications, there is no specific bit frame for the SPI communications. So, it becomes easy to send the receiver data.
well there are the multiple modes in the sbi communications which gives flexibility to program data in a in four different clock mode combinations this depends on the clock polarity and clock phase this allows the spi communications to interface with different types of serial devices let's check this table there are four different modes based on which the master and slave can communicate in first mode where clock polarity is zero and clock phase is also zero in this there is no delay for the clock pulses the data is output immediately on the rising edge of spi clock and input data is latched on the falling edge of the clock in second mode where the clock polarity is zero and clock phase is one the spi clock start after some delay and data is output one half cycle before the first rising edge of spi clock this input data is latched on the rising edge of spi clock and later the data is again output on the subsequent falling edges of the clock later comes the third mode the clock polarity is 1 and clock phase is 0 here the clock starts without delay but it start from the high states and data is output on the falling edge of this clock signal and the data is latched on the rising edge in last mode the clock polarity is 1 and clock phase is also 1 the spi clock starts after some delay and data is output one half cycle before the first falling edge of the spi clock and input data is latched on the falling edge of the spi clock but later the data is output on the subsequent rising edges instead of falling edge of the clock so these were the modes of spi communications well that's the basic of spi communications now we will see the spi communications data transmission how it will be work we look into how does the data transfer from master and slave devices in the spi communications protocol to start with that we need to see the hardware and internal blocks of master and slaves there are the shift registers in both pastures and slave devices the slave and master are connected in such a way that the two shift registers from an intel device circular buffer now this shift registers operating serially in serial out mode the output of the master shift register is connected to the slave shift register and the output of the slave shift register is connected to the input of the master shift register this makes the connections which operate in a loop the link which is connecting master shift register to input of the slave shift register is mostly line and the link which is connecting output of the slave shift register to the input of the master shift register is meso line well spi is a synchronizations communications protocol so there will be a clock signal for both master and slave for synchronizations and master generates this clock to get the control of the communications for now let's ignore the chip select line let's see how data is transferred from master to slave let's imagine the data in the master shift register is r7 to r0 and data is slave shift register is d7 to d0 where 
D7 and R7 are the MSB of the data and R0 and D0 are the LSB of the data. Means most significant bit and last significant bit. Master initiates the communications by generating the clock pulse. As soon as clock pulse starts, shift registers from both devices. Shift the first bit that is the master shift 0 and slave shift D0 to the right. Well, the master and slaves are connected in ring, so the ejected R0 bit gets stored in the MSB position of slave shift registers and these robots get stored in the MSB's positions. This is how the first bit travels from master to slave and from slave to master at the same time. When the master generates the next clock pulse, the preceding bits get shifted from the master to slave and slave to master and that's how each bit travels over MOSI and MISO line in the SPI communication. Protocol well, in this protocol, each slave needs a dedicated chip select line, but this can be eliminated by using daisy chain method. So, just one chip select line is connected to all the SPI slaves, and this daisy chain configuration is little bit different. The mostly line of the master is connected to the MOSI of the first of the first slave. The MISO line of the first slave is connected to the MOSI of the second slave. Again, the MISO line of the second slave is connected to the MOSI of the third slave. And finally, the MISO line of the third slave is connected to the MISO of the SPI master. So, these connections from a daisy chain architectures of the shift registers present in each device and eventually this eliminates the number of pins which are needed for slave selection. Now let's see how data is transferred from master to all slaves. For that the master will send the data to all the devices. For example, we need to send these data packets to the slaves with name slaves and slave 3. Let's call this 8 bit data as D1, D2, and D3. Now we want to send D1 data to slave 1, D2 data to slave 2, and D3 data to slave 3. To do so, initially, master needs to start the communication. So, well, we will pull the chip. Select line to low, which is connected to the all slave, and it will start the clock signal. First, we will send DT data to the first slave in 8 clock pulses through mostly line. As soon as this D3 data is stored in the first slave, master sends D2 data in next 8 log pulses through same line. But the shift registers of slave 1 already has DT data. So in this clock signal itself, the slave 1 will send DT D3 data to slave 2 through MISO line of the slave 1. Later, in next 8 clock pulses, the master will send D1 data to slave 1 simultaneously. Slave 1 will send to D2 will to slave 2 and slave 2 will send DT, D3 data to slave 3 and finally the slave 3 will send the response of the data transmissions to the master by using MISO line and that's how data is transferred from different slaves using daisy chain configuration. Well, 
that's all about the easy part of the SPI communications protocol. Now we will see the advantage and disadvantage of this SPI communications with very interesting analogies. Now we will see advantage and disadvantage. Initially, we will see the advantage of SPI communication. It has very low power consumptions compared to an I2C communications protocol. Because there are no need of pull-up resistors and SPI uses clock gatings, we know that the I2C communications requires the pull-up resistors to create the 3.3V or 5V ideal state. If a device needs to talk, it will pull the SDL line of clock line too low and high continuously. To send the data, the value of this pull-up resistor is in kilo ohms. But as we increase the data transmission speed, this value decreases. For example, we need 2 kilo ohms resistors for 400 kbps speeds. And this resistance value decreases further for higher speeds. So, Depending on this pull-up resistor value, the circuit draws very much current, which eventually results in power loss. But the SPI communication is much simpler because there are no pull-ups needed. The only power requirement is its consumption. Dynamic power from switching internal transistor and Input output lines. SPI uses clock gating. You know, in synchronizations communications, we use clock signals. And these are the great source of power dissipations because of its high frequencies and load. While clock signal do not perform any computational and they are used for synchronization. So, these signals are not carrying any information. The gated clock is one of the most important, which can be use the SPI communications protocol to reduce the power dissipations. If a device is not in use, then the clock line which includes synchronous storage elements such as flip-flop and latched can be shut down by turning of the clock of the particular device which eventually saves power. In SPI communications, we can enable a communications device with chip select which puts the other device to remain in sleep mode or power saving mode whereas in I2C even though the data packet is not intended for all slaves. All of them need to be awake and allow clock signal to pass each slaves in I2C communications continuously validates if the data package is more by comparing the addresses transmitted on the bus. This phenomena consumes power dynamically. Now we will see Bluetooth protocol. How does Bluetooth work? Bluetooth is a Fascinating technology. For example, when you play music on your wireless headphones, your smartphone transmits around a million ones and zeros to your headphone every second using the Bluetooth. But how are a million or so ones and zeros wirelessly transmitted every single second between your smartphone and your wireless earbuds? In order to answer this question, we are going to explore the engineering behind Bluetooth and the principles of wireless communication. Before we get into the details and specifics of Bluetooth, let's start with an analogy. When you see a traffic light change color, you recognize what that color change means. The traffic light uses a sections of the electromagnetic spectrum or lights 
to convey information. The green light has a wavelength of around 540 nanometers, yellow around 570 nanometers, and red around 700 nanometers. Your eyes can easily distinguish between the, these different wavelengths of light and your brain interprets these different wavelengths and the informations they convey. Your smartphone and wireless earbuds communicate using electromagnetic waves in a rather similar fashion but utilizing a different sections of the spectrum. Specifically, Bluetooth uses waves that are around 123 millimeters in wavelength. They are invisible to the human eye and can generally pass through obstructions like walls, rather like visible lights passing through glass. When your smartphone sends a long string of binary ones and zeros to your earbuds, it's communicate these ones and zeros by designating a wavelength of 121 millimeters as a one and a wavelength of 124 millimeters as a zero similar to the 540 nanometers green and 700 nanometers red. Colors of the traffic light. Your smartphone's antenna generated these two wavelengths and switches back and forth between them at the incredible rate of about a million times a second. With this process of switching between the two wavelengths, kind of like switching between the red and green traffic lights, your smartphone can communicate around a million ones and zeros every single second to your earbuds. And amazingly, engineers have designed the antennas and circuitry in your earbuds and smartphones to be attended to sensing and transmitting these wavelengths back and forth to the another. Before we dive into further details on Bluetooth, let's briefly explore and clarify these visualizations because they are potentially rather confusing. First of all, electromagnetic waves do not travel in a single direction in a sinusoidal fashion like this. In fact, the electromagnetic waves that are transmitted from your smartphone travel out in all directions like an expanding sphere. When your smartphone switches between the frequencies, it's as if it were a light bulb that rapidly changes between two different frequencies of millimeter length electromagnetic wave, which travel out as expanding spheres. As a result, your smartphones and wireless headphones can work in any directions. Thus, these visualizations of a directional sinusoidal wave is lacking. Eight, there are still merits to the visualizations. In order to give you a sense of how Bluetooth works, we are going to use four different visualizations that are all different perspectives of looking at the same invisible thing. Here, we have the sinusoidal waves which give us a sense of the frequencies wavelength of the electromagnetic wave. What's moving up and down is not the wave itself, but rather than it's the strength of the electric field. This perspective just shows as a directional silver or ray of the expanding sphere with the electric field going up and down as the Bluetooth signal propagated outward in all directions. If we were to measure the electric field at a single point in space, we would find that the strength of the electric field would increase and decrease sinusoidally and the number of peaks per second would be the frequency. Furthermore, we are ignoring the magnetic field components of the electromagnetic wave. As including, it would be too confusing. Let's move on to the second visualization. Here we have the traveling binary numbers which gives us a sense of the data being sent. However, it also doesn't uh, show the spherical propagations of the electromagnetic waves or the changing frequencies of the wave. Note that 
it's possible to send multiple bits at the same times which will explore later third we have the expanding spheres visualizations which gives a sense of the true near on that omnidirectional emissions of electromagnetic waves from your smartphone and headphones but it's difficult to show the frequency or the data that's being sent and it's rather visually complex to process and last we have the simplified spheres which helps us see that these two devices are emitting and receiving electromagnetic waves along the same frequencies but it doesn't uh, show us much else different visualizations are useful in different scenarios and with that covered let's get back to the focus of this video as mentioned bluetooth operates at around 123 mm of wavelength but specifically it operates between 120.7 mm and 124.9 mm of wavelength in the electromagnetic spectrum note that these frequencies are more commonly referred to as having a 2.4 to 2.4835 gigahertz frequency bandwidth or range just as our eyes see within a range on the electromagnetic spectrum bluetooth antennas see or perceives within their own range of frequencies now at any given time there might be the dozens of people using bluetooth devices at the same time in the same room to accommodate so many users the sections of the electromagnetic spectrum is broken up into 79 different sections or channels with each channels having a specific wavelength for one and another for a zeros and at any given moment your smartphone and earbuds communicates across just one of this channel for example these are the frequencies for ones and zeros in channel 38 whereas these are the frequencies for channel 54 now this begs the question if dozens of devices are using the same wavelengths and possibly the same channel how do your earbuds receive long string of the binary bits or messages from your phone exclusively well first the messages are assembled into packets in each packets the first 72 bits are the access codes that synchronize your smartphone and earbuds to make sure that it's your specific earbuds that receives the message these access codes are similar to the address words on a postal letter or the packages just a few lines of writing and stamps can send a letter which is the sending identical to millions of other letters to the exact house or address anywhere being sent the next 54 bits are the header which provides detail as soon as to the informations being sent to millions of other letters so to the exact house or addresses anywhere in the world the next 54 bits are the header which provides its details as to the informations being sent which in our analogy can be equated to the size of the letter or the box and the last 500 bits are the actual informations or payload kind of like the contents of our postal letter or box which in this case are the digital ones and zeros that makes up the audio that you are listening to if you are wondering how audio can be represented by ones and zeros take a look at this episode on audio codex okay so now let's add more complexity to the mix as mentioned bluetooth operates in a set of 79 different channels However, when your smartphone and earbuds communicate, they don't stick single channel, but rather they hop around from the channel to channel, kind uh, like a channel suffering on your TV. 
In fact, this hopping between the 79 channels, which is called the frequency hopping spread spectrum, happens 1600 times a second and after each hop, one packet of information composed of the address, header and payload is sent between your smartphone and earbuds. Your smartphone decades the sequence of the channels it will hop to and your earbuds follow along. Furthermore, if one of the 79 channels is noisy due to interference or is crowded with other user, then user smartphones adapts and does not use that channels until the noise clearance. This channel hopping also prevents anyone from even dropping on the information that that is being sent between the two devices because only your smartphone and earbuds know the sequences of channels that they will communicate across. Interestingly, because the information is divided and sent using packets, if your earbuds don't receive one of the thousands of packets, it says it didn't receive that the particular one and your smartphone sends the packet again. It might seem crazy or mind-blowing that the circuitry in your phone can generate pulses of electromagnetic waves a million times a second at very specific frequencies. Then have these pulses received the decoded by your earbuds. But uh, it happens, just think about how your screen has millions of pixels also emitting specific frequencies and strength of the electromagnetic spectrum or light at around 30 to 60 of more times a second. Technology is fascinating. One point is interesting is that Bluetooth frequencies range of 2.4 GHz to 2.4835 GHz is shared by other industrial and medical devices. For example, your microwave is in this range and has a frequency of 2.45 GHz. In fact, when your microphone is on, it can cause your headphones to lose track of the ones and zeros being sent by your smartphone or other word your headphones can lose the signal however please don't think your bluetooth headphones are dangerous because they emit a wavelength that's similar to your microwave that would be like comparing the light output from stadium food lights that from the stadium lights to the light from your smartphone screen and saying that because they both use the same colors of light. They will both cause damage when started at from a footway. Also, remember we mentioned that the electromagnetic waves from Bluetooth can easily travel through obstacles such as the walls of your house. However, the walls of the microwave are designed to block waves of the frequencies. You can test this by putting your smartphone in the microwave the Bluetooth signal from your smartphone to your headphone will be blocked and the connections lost. However, make sure not to turn on your microwave with any electronic devices inside of it. I repeat, do not turn on your microwave otherwise it will damage whatever electronics you put you put into it. In addition to microwave ovens, 2.4 GHz Wi-Fi networks also operate within this range of the electromagnetic spectrum. Similar to Bluetooth, Wi-Fi network divide this range or bandwidth into the 14 channels in order to accommodate multiple users communicating via Wi-Fi at the same time. You might be wound, we might be wondering if there are a bunch of different devices or sharing similar frequencies, one of them being a microwave that if poorly shielded can emit stray electromagnetic waves. How is it is it possible for your smartphones and headphones to send megabits of data every day? Second, is the error free? Well, as mentioned earlier, your smartphone does this by frequencies hopping and utilizing packets 
In addition to that, Bluetooth also utilizes the beats for the detecting errors and the circuitry in your smartphones filters out unwanted noise.